character. But many times we don't consider the fact that he had followers. How is that the case? Knowing New Testament teaching on the government of the church and on the conduct of Christians in the church. Looking at 3 John verses 9 through 10, we read, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Again, that's 3 John 9 through 10. Now, in John's third epistle, we are given this name, Diotrephes, very infamous character. But, you know, he heard the gospel at some point. He believed it and he obeyed the gospel. He was brother in Christ. And that tends to remind us of what I've said this morning and other times. That most of the New Testament is written to those who have obeyed the gospel who have become Christians, and it's trying to keep them faithful. That ought to imply to us that once we are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, we're just beginning. We're just starting. We're just on the straight and narrow way. That's an important thing you've done. So many people never obey the gospel. But yet we must remain faithful unto death. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 and Revelation 2, 10. And we often point to Diotrephes because of his desire for preeminence, seeing his rule over the church and the trouble that he caused in the church. But as I said earlier, we don't many times consider his followers. So we're going to, in this sermon, deal with his followers and we'll get to it in a moment, but we want to learn, ask the question of why. Why they would follow him. Why they would follow him. Now, we'll be noticing some reasons why members of the church might follow Dr. Fees, but let's keep in mind that the word preeminence is there describing his character. It's one thing to seek preeminence. It's another thing to practice what it takes to get it. And Diotrephes was practicing what it took to get it. We need to recognize that he was not accepting apostolic teaching. John said that he receiveth us not. That is, he doesn't accept what we say, 3 John 9. You'll remember on the day the church started, Luke recorded that those converts continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, John's an apostle. He is an ambassador of the court of heaven, as were the other apostles. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Christ, through the apostles, gave us his last will and testament. And here is a man who's in the church, and he desires preeminence so much that he will not even receive someone as the apostle of love, who is, who is John. Now, if the church had been what the church ought to have been, they would have listened to the teaching that's found... Uh, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother, now that would cover Diotrephes, that walketh the disorderly and not after the tradition which ye received of us. Some have in a more modern language says, this means you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you received of us. Tradition simply means what we commonly hand down. A faithful church commonly hands down, uh, hands down the gospel, New Testament teaching. That's traditional among uh, the Lord's church. That's what is traditional of God's people. Diotrephes made unjust uh, accusations against the teachers of truth. When he said he prayed it against them with malicious words. He was slandering John and those who would receive John, 3 John 10. You know, Paul said one time that he was slandered because certain ones were saying that he was teaching Christians to do evil that good may come. You know, there's all sorts of things said against the Christians, against the apostles. If you're going to live faithful lives in the church, 
You're going to have to endure some of that. If you can correct it with those who are in error in doing it, then you need to do it. That's true. But you're going to have to live with some of it. Paul said of those who erroneously declared that he taught that Christians are to do evil that good may come. When you go, when you go on down through the remainder of that passage in Romans 3, he said of them that their condemnation is just. A slanderer is to be condemned. God condemns him. The Bible says God condemns him. Godly people will condemn him. It doesn't mean they won't try to get him to repent. But you cannot, if you're faithful to God, you love God, you keep His commandments, you love the brethren, you care for the church that Jesus loves so much He shed His blood to purchase, you can't put up with this kind of thing. So Diotrephes refused to receive faithful brethren. And we shouldn't be really surprised since Dr. Fees would not accept John's words. If he wouldn't accept John's words, what do you think about those who were in harmony with John since John was an apostle and faithful to God? So by not accepting faithful brethren, those who conduct themselves, that is, according to, to the authority of the Lord, it meant that Dr. Fees was enforcing a standard that went beyond God's word. You'll remember that in 2 John verse 9, John wrote, Whosoever transgresseth, the American Standard Version says, Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine hath both the Father and the Son, 2 John 9. And then he warned Christians in the next verse, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds, verse 10. You may not agree with what he teaches, but if you treat him like he's faithful, then you're partaking of his evil deeds. I don't think we in the church at all understand that today. Uh, if we have certain close relationships with people and they teach a false doctrine or they have things in their lives that are contrary to the truth, you're going to find some people that just won't give up their associations with them. And by association, I mean what the Bible says, fellowship. They just won't do it. And the whole crowd is going to suffer for it on the day of judgment. They can't get that in their heads that God said what He meant, and He meant what He said. So Diotrephes put out those brethren who refused to go along with Him. Uh, clearly, there were some brethren who wanted to accept John, but He forbade them. And the Scripture says He basically put them out of the church, 3 John 10. So, by implication, we know those brethren who remained in the church had to submit to diatrophies because he wouldn't tolerate if they didn't, if they opposed him, if they wanted to be with John, an apostle of Christ. Now, it may be that they did it reluctantly. Some people seem to think, well, that makes it all right. If you sin reluctantly, then God's going to accept it. Well, sinning reluctantly or sinning because you thoroughly enjoy it is still transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. And it separates you from God. In fact, sin is the only thing that can separate you from God. 1 John 3, 4 and Romans 6 and verse 23. Now, what did Dr. Fees do besides personally just being wrong in attitude, this preeminence and so forth? Well, he caused division and factions among the brethren that had nothing to do with standing up for the truth. You know, sometimes you can stand up for the truth and those who don't love it depart from you. That kind of thing happens all the time. And the Bible's full of that material. There is a division that is not authorized by the Bible. There is a division that is. If you must live the truth and stand up for the truth and speak against error and people don't have anything to do with you for that, well, that's what sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? You know, Jesus wasn't put on the cross to nail to it and put through all he was put through the night before because he said, consider the lilies. It was because he said things like, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. That's what got him crucified. Same Lord, same time, telling people what they needed to hear. You've got to real, realize that. He knew man, and he knew what they needed to hear for their own good, and if they needed to hear, consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin, trying to show them they should trust in God on the basis of His Word and not be anxious about the affairs of this life. Or if He told them that they were hypocrites and serpents and generation of vipers, He knew their hearts too. 
He loved them, went to the cross to die for them. But he knew what they needed to hear so they could straighten their lives out. So here are reasons that Diotrephe should have been marked and withdrawn from by the church. But he wasn't. The fact that Diotrephes remained in the church, wielding his bad influence, proved that he had a following of brethren in that church because he couldn't have done it if the brethren hadn't led him. So now we're to the point. I thought that background material needed to be said to look at some of the reasons why Christians might follow somebody like Dr. Fees. Now there may be other reasons, but these are some I know that uh, are so because these are reasons people follow about anybody. They trusted him. We got on some of this this morning in the class and a little bit maybe in the sermon, but in the class in particular... If you trust somebody, your confidence is placed in that person. And you tend to follow them wherever they go. Or if they forbid it, you tend to follow them there too. This is not good to have that kind of trust and confidence in any person at any time. No matter how close you are to them. No matter how much you love them. They, in other words, were believing that Diotrephes was right and thought he was standing for what was right. Well, how do we know Diotrephes was wrong? Same way they could have known he was wrong. They needed to go to the Scriptures and they had know that he is not conducting himself like he ought to. And that's how it's done. It's dangerous to put our trust in anyone like this because men are fallible. The best of men are fallible. Imagine having your trust so placed in Peter that when he did what he did in Antioch of Syria and the church there, that he pulled away from eating with those Gentile brethren. And such a one as Barnabas, Paul says, was pulled away by his example. Now, Paul had to withstand Peter to the face. He's the one, Paul wrote that great love chapter, and I believe he loved Peter. And he reasoned with him to show how he had messed things up, and his example wasn't going to help things at all. Now, if Paul had been thinking like some brethren, he'd say, well, who am I? I'm a Johnny come lately. Peter was the one that had the revelation given to him that uncircumcised Gentiles had a right to the gospel, and was there preaching the gospel to Cornelius in his household. How can I dare confront him? Well, Paul tells us plainly that he was to be blamed. He played the hypocrite. And so Paul dealt with him. Because of this, the psalmist wrote, It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Psalm 118, verse 8. One of the first articles I ever wrote as a young preacher had this for a title. I've been surprised after 40 some odd years how often that article still shows up, first published in the Gospel Advocate back in the mid-70s. Now I wonder why that's the case. I don't consider myself the grandest writer in the world. I think I can communicate. The only reason I can figure it out is that somebody's experienced some of this somewhere, and that article brought out something they were personally familiar with or knew about. In other words, it struck a nerve, either for good or bad. Paul told the brethren at Corinth, be ye followers of me. I thought you said you weren't supposed to follow people, that kind of confidence. But look what he said. Dr. Fees would never said this. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Paul would have been the first one to say, don't just follow me blindly. Paul was saying, you follow me as I am following Christ. Now, what does that mean? It means just exactly what that says up there. We act on the authority of the words of the Scriptures because those are the words of our King. The implication was that if Paul was not imitating Christ, then they were not to follow him. Now, tell me a faithful child of God and all that faithful child of God means. It wouldn't have that attitude. You don't want your children to follow you into torment. I've said this many times in sermons, but imagine what hell would be like. <laughs> no, we can't except by the Word telling us what it's like, and still we can't fathom it. 
But how much more hellish would be hell if you get there and by the life you live, you see your children coming, following in your footsteps. So we're to follow brethren only as they follow Christ, not trust them implicitly so that we don't consider whether they are following Christ as they should. Now, I've seen that over the years of preaching more than I like to see it by people who just would not question somebody else. They had long ago, and their family long ago, had put their trust in, but it was a blind trust. Then it could be they liked him personally. Liked him personally. You can like somebody personally, and they still be just as wrong as they can be. You can love somebody dearly, and they can still be just as wrong as they can be. There could be many reasons that this happened, but as to why they liked him personally. Maybe he had a what we call a charismatic personality. Maybe they looked at him at a father figure, looking at him at the father maybe they never had. Maybe he was a good friend. Maybe he was a best friend. Some family member, some way or the other. Or other types of relationships that are common to all of us. Because I can guarantee you as surely as we are here this day, the devil will use every one of those things if he can to get you to sin. His job all day long every day is to get you to sin and never repent of it. Thus, there may, have, there may be a reluctance to do anything that would jeopardize the relationship that people have with one another. It may be because of money. Maybe you're in somebody's will and you will get taken out of it. There are various ways those things happen. Jesus warned that at times that we'll have to choose between our earthly relationships and our service to Him. What did he mean if he didn't mean that when he said the words of Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's pretty plain language. That's strong language. Jesus never backed up from telling the truth that every one of us needs because he was going to die for us and he wanted us to go to heaven. Jesus mentioned then these family relationships as they are usually the closest and most precious we have in this life. And they should be. But the principle would apply to every relationship we have. Paul said we're not to think of men more highly or above that which is written. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. There are lots of folks I think highly of. But I like to think, and to the best of my ability, as objective as I can, that I don't think of them more highly than what the Word of God says. And I, don't, I wouldn't think too kindly of them if they expected me to. Maybe the congregation or whoever was there that remained with him, supporting Dr. Fees, idolized him. Now, this doesn't mean they worshipped him as a god, literally. Instead, this is about putting him in the place of Christ, by listening to Him rather than to the Lord. That ties into some of what I've just said about others. In other words, instead of studying the Bible for themselves, they relied on Him to tell, him, tell them what to do, what was right, what the Bible said. And again, this goes back to the first point, as I said a moment ago, of trusting Him. The Bereans were commended because they refused to blindly accept what they were told, even what the Apostle Paul told them. And Luke records in Acts 17, verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Folks, you cannot escape this responsibility that we have we have this great responsibility to study for ourselves. Thus, Paul would tell Timothy, study to show thyself approved. American Standard says, give diligence. That the idea is being studious. Have that frame of mind that engages in such a study as to glean from it only what God wants us to know and do. 
By doing this, we can be sure we're following the Lord and not men. And you know, Paul uh, said plainly in 1 Corinthians 1.12 uh, that, uh, Are you following me or Peter or somebody else? Were they crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Peter or somebody? We must be careful and study the Bible for ourselves. It could be that they believed Diotrephes was well respected. Well respected. This could be within one's family. It could be within the congregation. It could be the brethren in the area, or maybe throughout the brotherhood as a whole, or some uh, educational institution, some preacher school, whatever. Having the, this perception that he is well respected would cause one to believe he'll be in the minority if he doesn't go along with the atrophies. I remember a situation in Austin when the matter of marriage, divorce, remarriage was really being discussed. And there was uh, Brother Warren with a Ph.D. in philosophy, and Brother Bales with a Ph.D. in philosophy, both of them in prestigious schools among the brethren, at least. And uh, one teaching one thing, the other teaching something else. And an elder to certain congregation, still meets over there, made this comment. I wish those guys would settle on what we're supposed to believe so we can get over this. Now, some people wouldn't have been that nutty to actually make that statement, but they think that way. Whatever my judgment's worth, it may not be worth much of anything, but coming out of my experience over the years, I think there are a lot of brethren who wish we did have a headquarters on earth and some sort of synod that would tell us what to believe so that we could be orthodox and not have to figure it out for ourselves. Now, they may not come out, as I said, explicitly in just so many words and say that, but they'd feel a whole lot better if they didn't have to determine for themselves what's right and what's wrong in the eyes of God. And no wonder, then, that you have denominations right and left that do it, and the biggest one is Roman Catholicism. They even tell the people, you don't have to study the Bible. We've got a clergy system, and we'll tell you what it means. So you see, the devil knows that. Look at the people he's got believing in Christ that continue to follow a religious organization that does that for them. No wonder then the prophet of old said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They value status quo. People followed diatrophies possibly because they valued status quo. People like the way things have been and are. That's not necessarily bad. It's just according to what it is. Diotrephes could be a longtime member or at least represent the church's history in that area or its heritage or making some Christians unwilling to stand up against him even when, he would, when it would be necessary to do it because of his doctrine or his life. I remember one time years ago, this would have to be 35 years ago, this lady was very elderly then. And I met her for the first time with her daughter. And we exchanged a couple of pleasantries as you normally do. And she said, do you know as a baby I sat on David Lipscomb's lap? Well... What is that supposed to mean? Uh, David Lipscomb was important to the church. If it hadn't been for him and the gospel advocate and his brethren with him, they pretty well stood up and kept the church from going into what turned into the Christian church, especially in the South, through the pages of the gospel advocate. But what is that supposed to mean to me today? He's been dead since, I don't know, 1917 or somewhere along in there. I had heard another preacher one time talk about the fact that there was a communion set in the church building in Tennessee in this certain city that was um, 
given to them by James A. Garfield. Now, I, I don't know if anybody knows who that is, but he was a president of the United States. And he was in the Federal Army when it occupied Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And that church still has that communion set that he gave to them. What, what does that mean? <laughs> what? It may be a historical thing, but what does it say about that church's faith or lack of faith? But there are people that think that way. And I don't know what it does. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't give Catholic sainthood to anybody. So we must be willing to change in order to repent of our sin, Revelation 2, 5. That, I think, is even changing in the mind of a lot of people. Just say you're sorry. God says, okay, and you keep right on doing whatever it is that's contrary to God's will. Well, that's not repentance. We, we have to change if we want to grow from where we are now in our knowledge of the Bible and practice of it to something better. Do we not? Ephesians 4, 15. We have to change to reach those with the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 9, 23, 23. Paul even said, I became all things to all men that I might win some. Well, he didn't mean changing the doctrine, but he meant respecting traditions and customs that went along with their place in the world. We must not hold the past so fondly that we're willing to go along with diatrophies simply because he represents the history or heritage of the congregation or whatever. But then there are those who may have followed him because he simply manipulated them. John indicated that Diotrephes was a liar and one who deceived others. If you read the totality of the New Testament teaching, departures from the faith, from the system of faith that is the New Testament system, means that you leave the truth and when you leave the truth and turn to something else, guess what that something else is? It's a falsehood. It's a lie. You can't, you can't believe baptism is unto in order to the forgiveness of sins, to the believing, repentant, confessing person, and then turn around and say, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, and be teaching the same thing. One means one thing, one means something else. One is the truth, one's a lie. When situations like this exist, it will be those who are unsuspecting who will be deceived. That's what Paul was saying when he closed out the book of Romans in Romans 16, 17, and 18. He said they, they beguile the hearts of the simple. It means the innocent. They're, they're not knowledgeable enough. They're still maybe babes in Christ. And they grab hold of that which looks good and is flashy. And I use flashy with quotes to mean that it appeals to them. When it shouldn't. They haven't learned any better. So we must be always alert. That's what Peter's saying. Because the devil as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. And this will also include those who are his, his servants. And they disguise themselves as if they were servants of righteousness or messengers of truth. Paul just came out and said that to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15. We must not allow ourselves to be manipulated, deceived by a person like Dr. Fees or a group of them and thus end up joining him and opposing the truth. When Paul told Timothy, lay hand suddenly on no man, what was he saying? What's the message to you that will help you live a godly life and keep you from being in a mess? Don't just accept somebody because he looks good, smells good, sounds good. Test him with what he teaches and how he lives. By their fruits you shall know them. Not by necessarily what they say. It's what they bear out. If somebody stands here and says, you don't have to partake of the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week in the worship assembly of the saint. God doesn't demand that. The Bible doesn't teach it. Well, is that the truth? Or is it a lie? How are you going to learn? How does anybody learn? 
They have to study the Bible. They have to rightly divide the word of truth. They have to know how to ascertain the authority of their Lord. And they have to abide by it and evaluate all things in the light of it. If that's not the way it's done, what good is the Bible? How does it benefit you at all in going to heaven? Then the last one I want to mention is they were scared of him. Now, you can say they feared him, and that's what I said on the PowerPoint. They feared him. Diotrephes was willing to put people out of the church who would not follow him. I think you see in Diotrephes exactly how early apostasy started that would go and develop more and more over the next 300 years until finally it coming out of the apostate church, Roman Catholicism formed. Some way or another, those people let, allowed, permitted, thought he ought to do it, that is, diatrophies, put people out of the church. There's a temptation to compromise to avoid becoming an outcast. We usually tell teenagers, you know, don't let your desire to be accepted cause you to get yourself into a mess. But that's true of, of adults also. Adults put up a lot of things, compromise a lot of things, keep the job, to keep the family, to keep their wife or husband. I don't know how many people I've had tell me over nearly 53 years, it is 53 years of preaching now, they didn't obey the gospel because, well, my mom and daddy were very religious and dedicated, and they didn't, and if I were baptized into Christ, I'd be condemning them. What kind of logic is that? Your daddy and mother always want you to have much better than them. You think about it. What loving father or mother wouldn't want their children to have better than they had? And if they see you trotting right into perdition right behind them, you think that's going to make them feel good? We wouldn't think that way on earth, but we do when it comes to eternal matters. So parents need to be mindful of that. Children need to be mindful of that. When you look at why the parents of the blind man healed by Jesus and the rulers who believed in Jesus refused to speak up, to confess him. You remember what it said. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. John 9, 20 through 23 and chapter 12, 42 through 43. They didn't want to go against the flow. You see, the thing in our lives that's more important or should be, should be truth. Truth should matter more than any of our relationships. The more influential Diotrephes is, the more likely we will become an outcast for standing up to him. Remember David? People made light of him. His own brothers made light of him when he, when he was all upset because the armies of Israel wouldn't go up against Goliath. Out of all those armies of Israel, so faithful to God... Nobody would go up and meet this uncircumcised Philistine. And when David said he would, nobody could hardly believe it, and his brothers still made light of him. Why couldn't they get behind him? Why couldn't they bolster him up? Why couldn't they help him? You ever notice some people's reaction to somebody that uh, does good is try to pull them down? You ever notice that? When they do what God said and the way God said it and for the reason or reasons God said it, they don't like that. Because they're not, and you can't get ahead of me. So how do I keep you from getting ahead of me? I've got to pull you down to my level. We must not be afraid to stand up for what is right as the Bible defines the right. Peter encouraged Christians not to fear the intimidation of their opponents in 1 Peter 3, 14. We must be like the Apostle Paul and be willing to stand alone if we need be. Or like David who stood alone, 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 17. It's not easy to stand alone when everybody's against you as far as you can see. Regardless of the reason or reasons why we may be tempted to go along with one like Diotrephes, we cannot do so and be pleasing to the Lord. This is going to test our love of God, our faith in Him and His Word when people become more important to us than God does. And I promise you, in life, if you live faithful to the Lord, 
you will have situations from time to time come along in your family, among your friends, at school, on the job, your neighbors, that are going to challenge you. You're going to have to make up your mind, well, I know what God said, and I know He meant what He said, and I can't do that. Do you remember Joseph when Potiphar's wife kept trying her best to get him to commit adultery with her? He was educated in the truth. And he asked himself this question, how can I do this great sin before God? You realize how many problems that would solve that we struggle with and we would just say, I can't do that. It's contrary to God's will. Or I must do it. It's what God wants me to do. Think about Daniel. What put him in the lion's den? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why were they throwing the fiery furnace? Because they would not do evil contrary to God's will. Are those in the Bible to teach us? Surely, Diotrephes, we see his character. We don't want to be like him. But are we a follower? Is there a tendency for us to have the disposition of mind that his followers had to have? And his letter, as we conclude, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, he wrote, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.12. Was Paul crucified for you? Was Cephas crucified for you? The idea is, let your faith rest in Jesus Christ according to the word of Christ. He told them that they were not to follow Apollos, Peter, who Cephas or himself. Now they were good and faithful men, as far as we know. But you don't put your confidence and trust and faith in a mere man, no matter his godliness. Because he's not where he is in his godliness, because he put his faith in men. Peter wrote, don't fear the intimidation. Don't be troubled, 1 Peter 3, 14. We must follow Christ. Even if it means facing opposition, we must Follow Christ. I hope this lesson has helped. Because it doesn't just cover the exact situation altogether and is only applicable to what Diotrephes was doing. It covers everything we do. Because we live in a world. We're surrounded by men. In our families. And every other way in our society. Now do you think the devil knows that? And do you think he's going to do his best to use every one of those things to get us to violate God's law? And you know what doesn't work with me? It could work with you and vice versa. Everything in this world can be used by Satan to get you to violate God's law. That's all he's interested in. Nothing else matters but to get you to die having committed sin unrepented of. That's all he cares about. He works that way 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and so on. We need to be vigilant. For our adversary the devil goeth about seeking whom he may devour. So I hope this is helpful just in general everyday living. Raising your children. Associating with your family. On the job. In the school. Wherever it may be. If you're not a Christian, we beg you this afternoon to obey the gospel. God's power to save by believing that Christ is the Son of God. Repenting of your sins. Confessing your faith in the Christ and being baptized for the remission of your sins. There's only one way. There's many plans of salvation as there are lords to save us. And there's only one. If you're a child of God and you sin, repent of those sins. Resolve in your heart, I will never violate God's will again, not turn from it. Pray God for forgiveness as you confess it. That's the way it works. That's how you grow. That's how you develop. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.